Welcome to this module on retina. We're going to start off with the anatomy of the retina in this section. This is the picture of the eye in which you can see the 10 layers of the retina behind. And it is interesting to note that what you see is light is coming onto the retina from the front and it goes all the way through the transparent layers of the retina to the very back. The rods and cones are the, the layer which is right at the back and from there the signals are generated and they travel forward. The signal, the circuitry is transparent in the eye and that is very important thing which you need to understand and uh, hopefully you will see this in this video. The retina will obviously start off from the ora serrata which is the junction between the ciliary epithelium and the retinal epithelium and it goes back all the way towards the back. Looking at the 10 layers of the retina, the first layer which you see is the retinal epithelium. This is the outermost layer on the retina if you take it from that side. So that is the retinal pigment epithelium. We'll go into details of each of these layers separately but this is a picture just to show what we are going to go through and this is the Brooks membrane which is the basement membrane of the and in front of it you will see layer of photoreceptors or rods and cones and these are divided into their outer segment and then they've got their inner segment as well so this is the rod and this is different layers which it encompasses so if you see the photoreceptors are actually going to be encompassed in the outer segment of rods and cone the outer limiting membrane is still there the outer nuclear layer and the outer plexiform layer so actually the photoreceptors cover a lot of area of the 10 layers of the retina and though these structures are actually the transducers or the cells which transform electrical or light energy into electrical energy so that is very important to know that this is a transducer so rods and cones are just like you would have a sensory receptor of touch you touch and you can start initiate a feeling of uh, something touching you that is a touch sensation similarly in order to generate a sensation of vision visual signals you will have uh, light coming in and that will strike the photoreceptors. Now the important thing to note is behind the photoreceptors we've got a black curtain that is the retinal pigment epithelium. So all the light strikes in and it has got a retinal pigment epithelium which has got melanin inside and that absorbs all the light in there so that the light does not come back and it is not scattered back. Because suppose if you have got a camera and it's in a box, you will always see if you open the camera, you, can, you will see that it's all black. That is to prevent all the light from scattering inside. So people in whom the retinal pigment epithelium is absent or very less, especially in patients with albinism, in which the, the retinal pigment epithelium is absent, there's quite a lot of scattering in light and the patient usually cannot form a very focused image of the retina. So that is very important to know. And then you see if you go further, we see that there is a junction between the, the photoreceptors and the next cells is the bipolar cells. So those are the first order neurons of the visual pathway. That is very important to know. Because students usually tell us that uh, the rods and cones are the first cells in the visual pathway. Rods and cones are just transducers. So bipolar cells are actually the cells which are going to take up the signal and they are going to start the visual process. The important thing to note over here one bipolar cell might be subserving three or four cones because it tends to so as soon as the signal is generated is transformed it, it is going to have a narrowing effect the signal gets purer and purer and purer as it goes through first area where the signal is sort of 
uh, channelized or it is uh, composed into one signal is at the layer of the outer plexiform layer and then the next signaling will happen at the inner plexiform layer where the ganglion cells will be connected to multiple bipolar cells and they will signal out. So this is how you have the center and the surround effect, how you see a bright light and a dark band in front of it, that is how they generate. The cones are structures which are very high definition. In order to maintain that high definition, what we need is you need, usually one cone is connected to one bipolar cell. So that maintains a very high degree of sensitivity in the center. And you will see in the foveola in the center, usually the, even the, the, the ganglion cell and the bipolar cells have been spread outside so that you can accommodate more cones in the center and that is why the fovea has got the best resolution in that area. On top of that, you've got these cells which are called the horizontal cells. They are there to cancel out the noise between the different uh, phototransducers which are producing all the, because you can see so many signals are being generated by light coming in that it becomes a chaos and the eye visual signals are consolidated uh, slowly and slowly as the signal goes down to give you a very fine picture. So you've got the bipolar cells and then they have their synapses in the outer plexiform layer and then they have the synapses with the ganglion cell in the inner side which is called the inner plexiform layer. Then you can also see their sort of supporting cells which are the molar cells. They are actually engulfing the the bipolar cells and the ganglion cells and they provide a vertical structure or support for the retinal layer. Similarly, the horizontal layers, the cells which are the horizontal cells in this outer plexiform layer, then you've got the amacrine cells in the inner plexiform layer, they are going to provide sort of noise reduction in these plexuses but they also give support, uh, horizontal support to the network of retinal layers so the retinal layers do not slide or slip against each other. So then you go on the next layers you've got the inner plexiform layer and after that you've got the ganglion cell layer. The ganglion cells are the second order neurons of the visual pathway and these have got small exon on one side which synapse with the bipolar cells but on the other side they've got a very big exon that is going to be called the nerve fiber layer, the retinal nerve fiber layer and these cells are actually going to go, they're going to take off from the ganglion cell then they take a 90 degree bend and then they go in and go towards the optic nerve with another take another 90 degree bend and then they go back all the way to the optic nerve going back to the optic chasm where half of them split towards one side and the other half go to the other side and then they synapse in the lateral geniculate body. So the third order neuron or the last order neuron for the visual pathway is the cells from the lateral geniculate body which are going to go in the occipital cortex. So that is the signal which goes from the eye to the brain and this is the sensory signal the pupillary response is going to be different from this signal which we've already discussed in another lecture. And on the inner side, the basement membrane or there's a membrane which separates the vitreous from the retina is the internal limiting membrane. And in some diseases, this internal limiting membrane tends to contract and it can produce folds in the retina which are called epiretinal membrane or you can go a macular puckering is something holding on catching on the surface. Now it's interesting that initially when we used to study anatomically the retina it used to be the histology slides which you used to show us the anatomy of the retina but interestingly nowadays we've got a living anatomy of the retina which can be studied using an ocular coherence tomography. Here you can see a black and white picture showing you the 10 layers of the retina. But in order to decipher that, the signals are slightly different. So what you will see, 
the darker signals over here will represent areas where you've got the nuclei of cells so the outer nuclear layer is going to be a darker band the inner nuclear layer is going to be a darker band and the ganglion cell layer is going to be a darker band but the plexiform layers here there are multiple synapses happening so when the light is an optical coherence tomography happens by shining a laser light onto the uh, foot onto the retina and then the light is reflected back and when the light actually strikes these plexiform layers there's scattering of light that's why you see these less intense bands or slightly grayish or whiter bands which is the plexiform layers of the retina so if you look at the layers of the retina you might think of it as a multi-tiered or a multi-layered cake so the slices are there which are the nuclei cells and the plexiform layers are actually the the layers of cream inside these slices so we'll go and look at the different anatomy of the cells so you can uh, easily identify those structures here you can see if you go on to look from the top you can see number 10 the internal limiting membrane then you've got the nerve fiber layer the ganglion cell layer inner plexiform layer inner nuclear layer outer plexiform layer outer nuclear layer and then after you've got your outer nuclear layer which is actually the the cell bodies of the rods and cones you've got the outer limiting membrane so that's a membrane which separates the 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 photoreceptor cell body from its outer segment uh, so after that you've got your inner and outer segment of the photoreceptors and then in the end you've got your retinal epithelium and below that the blackish area or the circles which you see over here they represent the choroidal blood vessels and beneath the retinal epithelial cells you will see a line which is the Brooks membrane and this Brooks membrane is the thing which is finishes at the optic nerve so it actually makes the opening of the optic nerve when you're checking for the optic nerve measurements on ocular coherence tomography here we made it easy for you to understand what parts of the cells are lying where in an ocular coherence tomography so you can see the biggest part is taken by the photoreceptor the photoreceptor has got two parts its outer segment and then it's got its inner segment here you can see this is the thicker part is the outer segment and this band which represents the inner outer segment the ISOS junction which is very important because this is the first thing which which is disturbed in any retinal pathology affecting the outer retina and if this is involved that means that the visual potential for recovery by doing any treatment is not going to be very significant then you've got the bipolar cells in yellow so you can see the cell body is actually the blackish layer and it's got its two plexuses in the in the inner and outer plexiform layer and the inside you've got the ganglion cell layer with a 90 degree bend going into the nerve fiber layer here we've made another picture of the photoreceptor and the retinal pigment epithelium let's look at the photoreceptor first it is important to understand the photoreceptor has got an outer segment an inner segment a cell body and then it's got its axon and it's got the pedicle or its dendrites at the end it's important to know which part is present in which layer so the outer segment is the photoreceptor layer then you've got the external limiting membrane the outer nuclear layer is actually the cell body of the rods and cone and the outer plexiform layer is the axon of the rods and cone now we come on to the retinal pigment epithelium it's a single layer cell and it's got microvilli on the inner side where the retina is where they are actually the villi are going to the, the, if the photoreceptor is over here, they're going to be present on both sides and they interdigitate to cover the outer segments of the photoreceptors. So what is the reason for that? What you want is where there's being transduced into electrical energy, there's a lot of debris which is created by this. So that debris is sort of repaired or it's engulfed by the 
retinal pigment epithelial cells and then it is so and it repairs the photoreceptor outer segment so that they are continuously being used the important thing is each of the retinal pigment epithelium is tightly attached to the next retinal pigment epithelium because the retinal pigment epithelium is bordering on the outer side you've got the choroidal vasculature and on the inner side you've got the retinal layer so you so one side you've got a river flowing and the other side you've got a relatively dry structure so they've got tight junction which prevents fluids or bigger molecules to going in the retina so that is called the outer blood retinal barrier then you've got an inner blood retinal barrier that is going to be between the endothelial cells of the capillaries of the retinal vessels then we want to see how the transduction of energy occurs in the in the photoreceptors as we know we've got vitamin a which is all trans retinol which is converted to all trans retinal then you've got an isomerase which converts it to 11 cis retinal and then this combines with scotopsin to produce rhodopsin and this rhodopsin is the molecule which reacts with light energy and that produces bartholorhodopsin and then lumirhodopsin so it goes to a higher energy state and then comes down and when the light sort of converts this and it splits it into different particles that is the time when the electrical signal is created in the rods and cones now we come on to the layers of the retina as you would see histologically so you can see the outermost area over here is the corio capillaris then you've got the brooks membrane and then you've got the retinal pigment epithelium then the rods and cones then the nuclei of the rods and cones then the outer plexiform layer in yellow and then you've got the bipolar cells in the inner nuclear layer then you've got the inner plexiform layer in yellow then you've got the ganglion cell layer and then you've got the retinal nerve fiber layer and the internal limiting membrane now the other thing which is important to know is the the capillaries which are going to synapse are going to synapse in the outer plexiform layer so the retinal blood vessels are going to be present beneath the internal limiting membrane they go inside and then they produce their arterioles and then they convert have their capillaries in the deeper layers so now let's study the different cells which we have in the retina the retinal pigment epithelium is a single layer of hexagonal cells the apices of which manifest villus processes which we've discussed before the rpe cells at the fovea are taller and contain more melanosomes then elsewhere in the retina because here you've got more cones so you have to cover all these cones and provide them in repairing processes that is why the retinal pigment epithelium are more in this layer adhesion between rpe and the sensory retina is weaker than between the rpe and the brooks membrane so the potential space which we know is embryologically present between the rpe and the sensory retina is called the subretinal space and this is the space where fluid can accumulate in the retina in cases of retinal detachment or central serous retinopathy so that is very important sub rp the rpe on the other hand prevents accumulation of subretinal fluid it produces it has a pump which is continuously taking fluid out from the rub retinal space and giving it out to the choroidal vasculature so it is actually keeping the retina dry and uh, that is the feature of retinal pigment epithelium which is very important patients with retinal detachment when they've got a hole so when the hole is connected to the subretinal space actually the aqueous flows into the subretinal space and the rpe suck that fluid out from the subretinal space and that causes hypotony in the eye that's why when you got a retinal detachment especially a regmatogenous retinal detachment that is why the, there's a shunt from the aqueous back into the vitreous and through the retinal hole the rpe actually are the pump which absorb the fluid in that area 
This is just an OCT to show you how the subretinal space can open with fluid. That's blackish space is a subretinal fluid which is present. And this was a patient with central serous retinopathy. And you can see below that fluid, you've got that line of cells. That is the retinal pigment epithelium which is intact over there. Next important structure is the Brooks membrane which separates the RPE from the choriocapillaris. Changes in the Brooks membrane are relevant to the pathogenesis of many macular disorder, especially age-related macular degeneration where this membrane is, is affected. Then we are going to see the different parts of the central retina. So the central retina is divided into a macula. Here you can see that bluish area, which is about three times the diameter of the disc, optic disc, that is called the macula. And inside the macula, then you've got a fovea and a foveola, and you've got a foveal avascular zone. So these are complex things. Let us go into more detail and see what they represent in the next slides. So macula, it is a round area at the posterior pole. So it is present temporal to the disc and the blood vessels, the temporal, supratemporal, infratemporal blood vessels, they arch around it in order to give that foveal avascular zone in the center. It measures approximately 5.5 millimeters in diameter and histologically it contains xanthophyll pigment. So if you look at the picture in the center of that blue circle, you see that area is slightly darker. That is because of the retinal pigment epithelium shining through that area because the in the foveal area the retinal layers are thin and the other thing you see it also gives a slightly yellowish hue that is the xanthophyll pigment there are more than one layer of ganglion cells present in the macula and that's how you define the area of the macula where the ganglion cells are more than one layer so that is different from rest of the retina then we come on to fovea. This is a depression in the inner retinal surface at the center of the macula and the diameter is 1.5 millimeters about the optic disc and ophthalmoscopically it gives an oval light reflex due to increased thickness of the retina and the internal limiting membrane in this area. Then we come on to foveola. This forms the central floor Fovea is where you start setting that slope of the macula, but fovea is the actual area which is flat in the center. This forms the central floor and it's got a diameter of 0.35. The important thing, it is the thinnest layer of the retina and it is devoid of ganglion cells and consists only of cones and their nuclei. If we look at this cut section, so foveola here is, is the center. Here you can see the number of the nuclei are much more because the cones are more dense over here and they tend to arch slightly forward. And all the, the outer plexiform layer, the inner plexiform layer and the bipolar cells all have been moved outward. The reason is you want more light to go in into that fovea and to make that crisp signal which you see. And on the other side, you can see fovea is that yellow circle and the foveola is that blue circle which you see in this area. And then there's another area, the red area, which you see is the foveal avascular zone. The important thing is before you've got the foveola, actually the capillaries, they stop in that area because there's no plexiform layer in that area. So the, the capillaries are not present in that area. So that all the fluid or nutrition comes by diffusion in that area. The foveal avascular zone is located within the fovea, but it ex extends beyond the foveola. The exact diameter is variable and its limits can be determined with accuracy only by fundus fluorescein angiography. Here we see a picture in which you can see this is a picture with diabetic retinopathy. These yellow whitish spots which you see are glowing. These are actually microaneurysms. And here you can see the foveal avascular zone, the black area in the center. And here you can see it is actually extending slightly in the inferior lesion. The FAZ or the foveal avascular zone is slightly enlarged in this patient. 
that represents that the patient is getting ischemic maculopathy. So that is very important to know in patients with ischemia. Then you've got an umbo. Here you can see a smallish dim reflex at the center, the whitish reflex. It is a tiny depression which is very center of the foveola. It corresponds to the foveolar reflex. If you shine with a direct ophthalmoscope or a 90D lens, central reflex, whitish reflex that is coming from the umbo, loss of which may be an early sign of retinal disease. So you've got a loss of retinal reflex. So what are the symptoms of retinal disease? So impairment of central vision. Here you can see a blackish central scotoma. A positive scotoma is something which is obstructing central vision, while a negative scotoma is patients with optic neuropathy. Something is missing or there is a hole in their central vision. Let's see the different pictures. So positive scotoma, you see an additional structure which is present, while in negative scotoma, you see an area which is, so if you're seeing somebody's face, that central area is going to be absent. So negative scotoma is typically seen in dry macular degeneration. So, there, so if somebody's got a central serous retinopathy, early stages you will see a positive scotoma because the retina is being stretched, the photoreceptors are being stretched, so additional signals are being generated that produce that positive scotoma. Then you can get a half side loss of perception and the other thing you can get is zigzag pattern which is typically a characteristic of of migraine which is a central phenomenon and it is not a retinal phenomenon and due to vascular dilation. Then we want to be sure that we know what are the visual field effects which you get with optic nerve dysfunction compared to a macular dysfunction. Here you can see an arcuit scotoma going that is typically a symptom of optic nerve disease. The macula is being spared. Similarly, you've got a tunnel vision on the second slide that tells you that's advanced glaucoma. Then you can get an outer peripheral wedge or temporal wedge in a patient in the slide to the lower left. And the slide to the lower right, you can see an, a C. del scotoma present in the gerunds area. So those are all features of glaucomatous visual field. Typically, if you have a central defect, which we showed in the last picture, that is a feature of macular disease. Let's see, there's some other features which are metamorphopsia or distortion of perceived images. So if something looks wavy, that is more. Micropsia is decrease in image size caused by spreading apart of foveal cones is less common. And macropsia is increase in image size due to crowding together of foveal cones. Both of these are not very common, but these are things which you tend to see with macular disease. So if you suspecting a patient with macular disease, you ask him, do you see any distortion of, of things or lines which you see in front of you? Then color desaturation. This is a feature of optic nerve disease. So normal image and a desaturated image. And so it's not typically a feature of optic or not a feature of macular disease. Then we come on to the blood vascular system. You've got the arterial system. You've got the central retinal artery, which is an end artery that enters the optic nerve about one centimeter behind the globe. So it enters beneath and then enters into the optic nerve and it composed of intima, internal elastic lamina, a media, and an adventitia. And then you come on to retinal arterioles, which arise from the central retinal artery. You contain smooth muscles, within them and unlike arteries their internal elastic lamina is discontinuous. Here you see very early phase or an arterial phase of a fundus fluorescein angiogram. Usually the arteries are going to be present in front of the veins in the retina. So if you want to remember from a numeric A comes before V so arteries are present in front of the veins and arteries with age, with hypertension, they tend to get sclerose and they tend to get thick. They can press on the veins and that is the time when they produce that arteriovenous nicking where the veins are pressed and sometimes the thickness is so much they can actually cause an occlusion of a branch retinal vein. So these are the arteries which you see are white and the other dim 
things which you see are the veins so these initially the arterial flow you just see the arteries and then you get an arteriovenous phase and then you get an early venous phase and then you get an arteriovenous phase together the retinal capillaries they supply the inner two third of the retina the outer one third being supplied by the corial corial capillaries so retina has got a dual circulation two blood vessels that's very important it is such a complex structure the inner capillary is located within the ganglion cell layer and the outer capillaries are located in the inner nuclear layer or the outer plexiform layer the capillary free zone and the periarterial capillary free zone and the foveal avascular zone then we come on to the blood retinal barriers we've already discussed the inner blood retinal barrier are the tight junction of the capillary endothelial cells while the outer blood retinal ba barrier is the tight junctions of the retinal pigment epithelium venous system drains blood from the capillaries you've got the small venules which are larger than the capillaries but have a smaller structure then large venules contain smooth muscles and gradually merge to form veins in which contain small amount of muscle and elastic tissue in their wall and are relatively distensible and usually the microaneurysms in diabetic retinopathy tend to form on more on the venous side of the blood circulation here you can see an artery arteriovenous phase the arteries are totally white and the other grayish looking blood vessels with a laminar flow that is present because of the vein this patient has some filling defects due to scars or obscurations in this area so that is why it looks black in this patient then how do you check for retinal integrity you've got a fundus camera on the left side and then you've got an ocular coherence tomography on the right side so the fundus camera is going to check the physiological flow of blood in the retina while an oct is going to check the anatomy exact anatomy of the retina so while the fluorescein angiogram is a is a live capture of flow of blood through the retina the oct is a still picture but now you've got an angio oct where you can get a dialysis photograph so there's no dye injected but you can still take a picture of the retinal flow which is called as angio oct which is the future nowadays here you can see let's go through the different phases of the fundus fluorescein angiogram this is a colored photograph of the right eye and this is a similar picture but it shows the retinal blood vessels are black the arteries and veins are both black so this is a red free picture and this is not a fluorescein angiogram picture and you can see a blackish dot around that foveola that is the a microaneurysm due to diabetic retinopathy this is the fluorescein angiogram this is an arteriovenous phase the arteries still are more white compared to the vein in this and here you can see as you grow further those microaneurysms will become bigger in structure and this is showing you the foveal avascular zone in the center which is enlarged and the microaneurysms are leaking and this is a late phase showing more leakage of the aneurysms here you can see more leakage and this is ocular coherence tomography which we showed you earlier but the important thing to see is they've got multiple slices the pathology might be present in the superior retina so if you just take a slice in the inferior part that might not show up all the disease so it is important to take multiple slices of the ocular coherence tomography and then to analyze the disease accordingly here you can see a patient it is a central elevation of that foveal contour and there is fluid present in the foveal area which is cystoid macular edema which is due to diabetic retinopathy here you can see there is no elevation of the subretinal space but there is just that area so those are the things which you see in patients on oct so in conclusion retina is one of the most vital part of our vision and understanding the retinal layers is very essential in understanding retinal pathologies and knowledge of the normal anatomy helps us understanding these retinal pathologies and especially interpreting the investigations like fundus fluorescein angiography and ocular coherence tomography thank you very much for watching this lecture hope you'll subscribe to our channel and we look forward to seeing you again thank you